Hello and welcome to this program for NewsClick and The Wire. With me here, I have an eminent political scientist, a person who is extremely knowledgeable about what's happening in the state of Karnataka. All eyes are on Karnataka and in a short while from now, the outcome of the elections to the state legislative assembly will be known. Let me welcome Professor Sandeep Shastri. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Uh, you are the Pro Vice Chancellor of JN University and the National Convener of the Lokniti Program, which looks at election analysis for the Center for the Study of Developing Societies. Professor Shastri, how significant are these elections at a national level for both the Bharti Janta Party as well as for the Congress? Uh, Paranjai, given the type of attention that Karnataka has got both at the, in the print and the electronic media space. It's very clear that uh, Karnataka is being watched closely by the entire country. Now, I would say for multiple reasons. The two principal contestants at the national level, the BJP and the Congress, are in what looks to be a direct face-off in Karnataka. And therefore, for both these parties, Karnataka is so very critical. Uh, for the BJP, uh, if it has to continue its winning streak after 2014, uh, Karnataka is a critical element to, if you may, complete the circle. After all, Karnataka was the first and only state in southern India which has had a BJP government. Very true. Uh, Karnataka was their gateway to South India. And even today, Karnataka seems to be the only state among the five states where the BJP can hope to come to power on its own steam for some time. Uh, the fact that they have been in power in Karnataka earlier is both a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, there is also another point, uh, Paranjoy, which is that uh, whenever the Congress and the BJP have been in a direct face-off since 2014 at the state level, the Congress has been consistently losing. I am going to come to this in greater detail because there is the third play. We cannot ignore the Janata Dal secular. They, in, in 2013, they got about a fifth of the vote. So, but you, I mean, when you just look at it from the perspective of the two national parties, the BJP and the Congress, and in the run-up to the next general elections, which are scheduled to take place in April, May 2019, Karnataka becomes extremely important. Yes, because as, as you said, if BJP were to win Karnataka, it builds up the momentum for them in the three states where they have been in power for a long time, especially Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh and also Rajasthan. So it builds up the momentum for the party in those three states and also for next year's Lok Sabha election. So for the BJP, winning Karnataka is critical to maintain that momentum going forward and in preparation for next year's uh, Lok Sabha election. And so and in that, that sense, it's a semi-final. Semi and and then for the Congress, after having become weaker than it has ever been, India's grand old party in 2014, and, and Narendra Modi, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's claims that he wants a Congress Mukt Bharat, Karnataka becomes so important. So very true. This is the only big state they are in power. The other uh, two and a half states being uh, Punjab, uh, Mizoram and Puducherry. So if they were to, if the Congress were to lose Karnataka, the BJP dream of a Congress Mukt Bharat no longer remains a rhetoric but becomes much more of a reality. Also, Paranjay, winning Karnataka for the Congress would put a stop to this continuous losing streak. It implies the Congress has not been able to win back or retain a state they were in power since 2014. And this in a sense reverses that process. And I think also uh, winning Karnataka is important for the Congress to claim that legitimacy of space to lead the anti-BJP coalition. Correct. Uh, so, so, uh, if you lose Karnataka, you have no claim to that space and you'll have to forfeit that space to somebody of, from of, the of, of be, being the, the single biggest opposition sure. uh, party in that's the country. True, that's true. Okay. Now, now, what is truly unique about Karnataka? Uh, it is said that there are conflicting trends. Though in 2013, the Congress did get 122 out of 224 uh, seats in the Vidhan Sauda. Uh, if you look at the last uh, three decades, especially since 1983, no ruling party in Karnataka has won a majority in the state legislative assembly. 
At the same time, we also see that typically Karnataka has voted in a manner which is against the, the so-called so national trend. So Karnataka has historically, at least in the recent past, the assembly has been led by a party which is not in power in New Delhi. So, so in this sense, we see two apparently conflicting trends. You, you're perfectly right. Last 32 years since 1985, a ruling party has not been voted back in Karnataka. Uh, there may be a debate about 2004 uh, when uh, no party got a majority and the BJP emerged as the uh, single largest party. And the Congress formed the government in coalition with the JDS. But I would argue that 2004 Congress lost the election though it formed the government with the JDS. So every election the ruling party has been voted out. And the second trend you talk about is equally interesting which actually predates the first trend we talked about. The second trend has been in visible existence in Karnataka for the last 35 years. That is, Karnataka votes in a state assembly election very differently from a national election. Right from 83, you look at every state assembly election. 83, 85, 89, 94, 99, Correct me if I'm wrong, even earlier. I mean, for instance, the emergency, yes. after the emergency in 77, yes. Yes. Uh, when the Congress party got voted out of most they parts of India, well in the Karnataka. southern part they of India, well including in Karnataka. Yes. So, Karnataka so, they did well. so some would argue that one of these two trends are likely to be sidetracked with this election. If the BJP were to do well and get a majority, this trend about not aligning with the national with the party in power at the national level would get defeated. If the Congress were to retain power, the fact that a ruling party comes back to power, one of these two are likely to be negated is what a, what a lot of people argue. This is the big question and, and you know, the, the EVM machines have been sealed, we've had the biggest ever voter turnout, about 72 percent or the, a little more than 72 percent. So this is really the question, which of these two trends are likely to prevail? So as a political scientist, what is your hunch? I mean, you'll be either proved right or wrong very soon. Uh, I have, at this point of time, I would go against what a lot of people are saying that Karnataka will have an assembly without a clear party, without a majority for any one party. Uh, I would believe that's not likely to happen and I'll tell you why. I would believe that either the Congress or the BJP would either be close to the majority mark, plus five, minus five. Uh, I, I'm convinced that either the BJP or the Congress would score a century. Okay, and so I mean the halfway mark is 112, 111, 111 is the halfway mark now. because there are two yeah, seats. Two seats are countermanded. Uh, so plus five, minus five is what I'm looking at. Why do I say that uh, the state is not likely to have a house with no clear majority? Uh, we have had such a situation twice in the past, 1983 and 2004. And both these elections, I would argue, were elections of transition. 1983, we were transitioning from a one-party dominant system to a competitive party system. Uh, Congress had been continuously in power. So, in 1983, people voted out the Congress but did not, did not vote in somebody. They gave Janta Party the largest number of seats, but it required one more election for that competition to be Congress versus Janta Party. 2004 was the second transition where the two main parties in the competition changed. It was Congress versus Janta Dal till then. It became then the it became BJP. Congress versus BJP. So that was the second transition. So I'm not too sure that we have any third transition happening this time. W so one minute, uh, I'll interrupt you here. The Janta Dal secular, led by former Prime Minister H.D. Devi Gauda and his son, the former Chief Minister H.D. Kumaraswamy, in 2013 got a little over one fifth of the vote, 20.2%, rough. 40 seats in the assembly. There, are, there is a view, a, a widely prevalent view, that Kumaraswamy and Mr. Deve Gowda would be the kingmaker. That if it's a close contest, then the seats that would be obtained by the JDS would make the difference to either party. And the next part of that analysis, or the speculation if you like, is that since the BJP is in power, for the, has been in power for the last four years, and it seems to be better endowed at present than the Congress, uh, the chances are advantage BJP. Uh, now, undoubtedly the Janta Dal sees itself as a kingmaker. Of course, 
officially they say we are not the king maker but we are the king but realistically i think a more of a king maker and their hope is no party gets a majority on its own and it is inevitable that one of the two approach them uh, to be able to form the government and uh, I, I, now i would look at both scenarios uh, if the congress emerges as the single largest party uh, the bjp would be very keen to tie up with the janta dal simply to prevent the congress from coming to power uh, ala meghalaya goa manipur very much similar to that situation they where were a similar situation and in the last moment sure the bjp yeah uh, uh, swung uh, 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 manages to ensure that the congress because the larger battle is between the congress and the bjp if the bjp were to emerge as the single largest party i think they would be happy to discuss the coalition with the janata dal the only thing is they will be on a stronger wicket and not concede the chief ministership to the janata dal that, that's that's an important point because either way assuming let's if, if we say hypothetically if this is the situation either if the congress is the single largest party or the bjp is the single largest party the two chief ministerial candidates mr sidaramayya on one side and mr yedurappa on the other side would perhaps tend to get marginalized because in the deal making in the bargaining mr kumar swami will would at least claim the post of chief minister you are perfectly right that if either the bjp or the congress do not touch a century and either of them are bidding to come to power their current chief ministerial candidates will have to be put on the back burner beyond a shadow of doubt uh, for a slightly different reason than what you say if it were to be the bjp the the relationship between mr yedurappa and the janata dal has been of late very very tense partly because of the past experience so if there were to be a tie up between the bjp and janata dal i think one of the conditions janata dal would put is mr yedurappa is not among the options to lead the government but so you can equally argue that since mr sidaramayya once upon a time was a member of the jds right i mean he uh, mr kumara swami would sure. say he's sure. he's a, he's uh, ditched uh, me if, if we are talking of a congress jds alliance the first issue on the table would be mr sidaramayya not be considered and some would argue that the statement that the chief minister made yesterday that i am quite okay with the party choosing a dalit, a dalit candidate leader. as chief minister is linked to this possible development because uh, as you rightly said if you are talking of a congress jds alliance the jds would have nothing to do with mr sidaramayya given his past association with the party and in that situation we are talking of a dalit leader people are talking of malikarjun kharge people are talking of parmeshwar uh, both of whom have reasonably good equations with the janata the leaders uh, don't rule out somebody like an sm krishna like a uh, mr uh, like uh, dk shivkumar also playing a role so there are several players who could play a role several me, candidates yeah, let me add another uh, point here uh, some would argue that of course it depends on the seat uh, numbers some would even argue the janata dal patriarch may be very happy to concede the chief ministership to the bjp or congress depending on who is in front because then it gives him an opportunity to make his elder son who has never had deputy chief ministership or chief ministership to make him the you are talking chief about minister. mr revanna no revanna it gives him a chance to make revanna the deputy chief minister either in a congress led or a bjp led government. so so the, so the possibilities oh, the are many and we can immense. speculate but we don't need to because in a short while from sure. now the outcome would be known but your hunches your instinct says that there is a distinct possibility that we won't have this kind of a situation for several reasons one i think the fact of a high voter turnout uh, yes, implies it is it's a record yeah, turnout it's a record turnout to the state over 72% it is for me that there has been very strong uh, mobilization by the parties and a l- very strong assertion by the voter that she wants to make a point with regard to who should be coming to power so i think a high voter turnout depending on the areas we are talking about would benefit the key players in this contest and it gives me even greater confidence that uh, a particular party congress or bjp no, would emerge there is you know you are the national convener of the lok niti 
program of CSDS and you've studied this, uh, the, the voting patterns, voting trends across the country. What does a high voter turnout indicate? Now, there, there, are, there are different views. I mean, one view says that uh, you can't make a claim either way that it's going to either favor the incumbent regime or it's an anti-incumbency vote. In, with specific reference to Karnataka, how does this, what does this record voter turnout in excess of 72%? Last assembly elections, it was closer to, it was around 70%. What, what are the implications? Uh, Paranjai, to the best of my uh, knowledge, there is no empirical proof to demonstrate that a high voter turnout either favors the incumbent or favors the challenger. However, I will add three points which I think would be important pointers to this direction. One, Karnataka's battle is essentially in the regions, in the six regions of the state. Uh, uh, analysis of the higher voter turnout by region could give you an indication as to who is possibly going to benefit from this. Some people have argued that there has been a significantly high voter turnout in Mumbai, Karnataka. Uh, I'm sorry, there has been a lower turnout in Mumbai, Karnataka and a higher turnout in coastal Karnataka, Hyderabad, Karnataka and in central the Bangalore Karnataka. region and okay. central Karnataka. So, so that has important implications. The well, second, would, would you yeah. like to uh, expand, elaborate on this? Uh, as you say, there are broadly six regions in Karnataka. In the northern part, you have the Hyderabad, Karnataka, the Mumbai, Karnataka, then you have the coastal Karnataka, then you have the central part, and the southern part, you can say the old Mysuru and the greater Bangalore region, and the rest of southern Karnataka. What, what, what are the likely, I mean, how different okay. are these five or six regions in the state? Uh, point number one, the Congress has a spread across these regions. The Congress support base, vote base is across these regions. On the other hand, historically, the BJP support base has been limited to four of these regions, uh, five of these regions, I would say. Hyderabad, Karnataka, Mumbai, Karnataka, Central Karnataka, Coastal Karnataka, and the Bengaluru region. The BJP is not much of a force in Southern Karnataka. On the other hand, the Janta Dal is largely a force in southern Karnataka and in Bangalore region. You refer to the Janta Dal winning 40 seats last time. In fact, 32 of those seats have been in southern Karnataka and in the Bangalore region. So there is a clear variation across regions. In fact, I draw your attention to the first May speech of the Prime Minister, where uh, most of us were taken aback when the Prime Minister praised Mr. Devagoda in his speech. Now, a deeper analysis would show that here is the reason. Firstly, he wanted to prove to Mr. Sidramaya that you are not the real Kanadiga, because Sidramaya had raised this Kanadiga versus non Kanadiga, Kanadiga issue, that you are not the son of the soil, the real son of the soil. The flag yeah, yeah. Of, uh, All those issues, that you are not the real uh, inheritor of the Kanadiga identity, but it is Deve Goda. But more importantly, was this a message of the Prime Minister to the BJP supporters in southern Karnataka, where the fight was between the Congress and the BJP, between the Congress and the Janta Dal, that... Transfer your vote... Transfer your vote to the, to the Janta Dal. JDS. I mean, or, or if you think that in, in a specific assembly constituency, uh, the contest is really between Congress and JDS. Transfer the vote Indirectly there. appealing to the BJP voter to go with the And JDS. also the fact that they have different support bases. And there are very few states where they both, that is the BJP and JDS, are in direct competition. Now, that also explains why, of course, two days later he retracted that in his next round of speeches. Uh, the larger point I'm trying to make is, in these six regions of Karnataka, the type of competition is very different. And just one more point on this question of voter turnout. I would say the more important point with regard to voter turnout is, who among the voters have come out in larger numbers? If it's likely to be the poor, inevitably, sir, almost inevitably, there is a poor I think, who come out to vote in large then numbers what, than the rich or the middle class. This is something which would definitely benefit the Congress Party, because uh, study after study has shown that the people who are economically marginalized in Karnataka tend to favor the Congress Party more, 
and it's and even more nothing to do with the incumbency no, factor no, no, and it's even more in this election simply because the various welfare schemes which the Congress party including started, including the five rupees a meal, ten yeah, the, the rupees bhagya a meal. schemes, the various bhagya scheme. Now that is something which a lot of people believe has touched the poorer sections of the society, and therefore a higher voter turnout among those sections is beneficial for the Congress. The other is if you have a higher turnout among middle class and the more affluent voters, that would be something that would benefit the BJP, and. Again, the record of Bengaluru city shows that voter turnout has not significantly increased in Bengaluru city. It is more in the, uh, rural, more in the area. rural areas. Uh, and as luck would have it, you had an election on a second Saturday. And uh, on Friday evening, people you had long queues of people in the airport deciding to leave the city. So, uh, uh, so that's one important indicator in, with regard to who could have benefited from a higher voter turnout. Okay. Uh, let me look a little bit at the caste equations. Again, uh, often it is argued that the two dominant castes, the Lingayats, accounting for roughly 17% of the population, and the Okaligas, accounting for roughly 15% of the population, they are considered to be the politically more influential castes. That, in a sense, their uh, views tend to influence the, the political uh, or politics in Karnataka. So if you look at caste equations and in the context of the Siddharamaya government, the minority status for Lingayats, which the BJP and the RSS, they have a different point of view because they say the Lingayats are part of uh, the Hindu community. How would you see the caste factor playing out uh, how do you think the caste factor has played out in these elections? From 1956 onwards, Paranjay, the Lingayats and Vokaligas taken together account for more than half the MLAs of Karnataka. Every assembly election. Now, Though, though they account for roughly one third of now, the population. That's the other debatable point. Uh, there has been no officially released caste census, caste census that was done during British days. And we are extrapolating from those days and coming to 17 and 15 percent. The Sidramaya government actually conducted a caste census which was incomplete and it was not released for because of the controversy it would generate. But the leaked caste census shows actually that the Lingayat and Vokaliga community as per that census was around 9 and 8 percent of the population in reality. That means they have shrunk. It's, act compared it's to actually the 17 percent taken together. And the scheduled caste, of course, that is, that's a government category. You need to look at each caste separately, but all of them taken together was actually around 22% of the population. But then going back to your main point, the Lingayat community, which is largely dominant in northern Karnataka, Mumbai Karnataka and Hyderabad Karnataka regions and central Karnataka to an extent, uh, the Lingayat community has been the backbone of the BJP support. Uh, every election last 15 years, save the 2008 election, the I'm say save the 2013 election, the BJP has been getting the bulk of the Lingayat votes, uh, partly because they have a Lingayat face as their chief minister, Mr. Yadira, and, uh, Mr. Yadira, and partly because the Congress has never been forgiven by that community for having very very unceremoniously removed the last Lingayat to be Chief Minister of the, under the Congress, Mr. Virendra Patil. In 1990, uh, Rajiv Gandhi forward. just announced Karnataka will have a new Chief Minister. And that has, that has, for the last 38 years, really nothing has been done by the, par, by, by the party. 30, 20, 20, 28, 28 years. years yes. Nothing has been done by the party to remedy that situation. Now, towards the end of his, of his government, Sidramaya announced that we would accord minority status, religion status to the Lingayat community. Now the hope was that this would drive a wedge in that monolith support that the Lingayat community has and given the, the BJP and at least a part of it would move towards the Congress. Now surveys seem to indicate that this has not happened. Surveys seem to indicate that the community still seems to be strongly behind the BJP. Uh, but, but if indeed the numbers are not as large as is presumed, the question would arise is what kind of influence the Lingayat community would have on other sections of voters, those belonging to other castes. Uh, 
uh, while numerically there may be there may be a debate on how much they constitute uh, in terms of candidates they are a critical number in both the congress and the bjp and in terms of influence in their constituencies i think they do play an important role however i must also add this point the congress move to give this minority status to the lingayat community has resulted possibly in a backlash among the vocaligas who say that while you have done something for one dominant caste you, you have not really done anything for us and the backlash of that some people feel was felt in the old mysore region bangalore and southern karnataka where the, where the jds saw a vocaliga consolidation that's correct But and especially because mr deve gowda and mr kumar swami belong, belong to, to that, that community however i must add another point this dominant caste consolidation towards the bjp and the janata dal has worked in another way which is the non dominant backward castes who are numerically quite large in number such as uh, the kurubas Uh, the edigas to which mr sidaramayya uh, the, the kurubas is the community to which mr sidaramayya belongs they have strongly consolidated in favor of the congress so you have this social so, so uh, if you look at the big picture of the state how would you summarize the way the caste equations could play out uh, the bjp seems to be the party preferred by the lingayats and the upper castes in large numbers the janata dal seems to continue to be the party which is supported by a majority of the vocaligas whereas the congress seems to have consolidated its presence among the non dominant obcs among the muslims among the dalits and among the tribals and i will emphasize the last three a little more uh, there was a belief that the muslim vote could get split between the janata dal and the congress Uh, data shows this may actually not have happened partly because of the belief that the janata dal and the bjp are in a tacit understanding and this led many would believe in the southern Muslims karnataka to gravitate the muslim towards to gravitate towards the congress, congress party no on this point it is correct me once again if i'm wrong it is presumed that the coastal karnataka the coastal region of karnataka is arguably where the communal divide has been very very evident and intense or has intensified in the recent past we've heard about the activities of groups like the shri ram sene we uh, we know about again internecine fights when i baliga who is supposed to be close to mr yedurappa he exposes what is supposed to be corruption in the temple trusts and then he is attacked in, by naresh shinoy who is the founder of the namo brigade so i mean again two questions how united so i mean the the so called hindu consolidation is it working on the ground is it working especially in karnataka in coastal karnataka and you could perhaps uh, uh, analyze what's happening in other parts uh, of the state as, well. I, I, as you rightly said i would do it in two different ways looking at coastal karnataka separately and the rest of the state on the question of hindu consolidation coastal karnataka has historically seen this consolidation not just in this election but it's been happening for quite some time now Uh, given the strong presence of minority communities in coastal karnataka especially the muslims and the christians and also the the economic power that they have started to wield uh, what the bjp has been to a certain extent successful in doing in coastal karnataka is ensuring a majority community mobilization in the coastal region so if you drive across the coastal region you will very clearly see the polarization that has happened on very strong religious, religious lines. lines very clearly on religious lines and that's the reason a lot of people would believe that the bjp is likely to do well in the coastal region because of this polarization that is achieved there is another factor coastal karnataka has always seen with every election a switch from the congress to the bjp and bjp to the congress and last time the congress did very well in the coastal region so people believe both these factors are operating across the state i would say that this mobilization on religious lines 
has not been as intense as you notice in the coastal region. Again, the last survey which uh, the CSDS Lokniti did, uh, which was in the uh, first week of May, now that survey shows first week of May of this year. I mean, we did a now, we did a pre poll just just uh, ten days ago. Uh, that poll shows that the Hindu vote, if you may, the Hindu vote is more or less equally divided between the Congress and the BJP. Uh, the belief so, was so that means the consolidation may not have happened. May not, it has not really happened as much as people thought it would happen outside the coastal belt. Uh, within the coastal belt, yes, that, cons that consolidation has been very intense. But outside the coastal belt, it has not worked so much. Uh, simply because I believe other factors are in play, that the, the, the social coalitions that are in place are in play. And that may have impacted on uh, religious polarization not being the only factor which defines and decides the direction that voters go. Okay. Uh, my last set of questions to you, and this is regarding the issue of corruption. And specifically, when we look at the, the illegal miners, Gali Janadhan Reddy, he's himself not contesting, but his associates, his family members are con contesting. I remember when I interviewed you when I was making a documentary film almost eight years ago, and you talked about how the Reddy brothers and their, their, their sort of uh, relationship with the Bharti Janata Party and the RSS, and you compared them to a family where there are two sisters-in-law. One sister, uh, one wife has come from a rich family, and another person's uh, a sister is from the same community. So she is accepted because she is a wife, but she has been there because of her money. But there is a subtle or sometimes not so subtle sort of differentiation between the two wives belonging to the, or, or wives of the two brothers. I found this a very interesting analogy. But today all these, uh, uh, it's no longer nuanced anymore. It's no longer subtle anymore. The same set of people who were accused of corruption by, among others, the, the, the then Lokayukta, Justice Santosh Hegde. And uh, it's all documented in writing how the family members of Mr. Yadurappa benefited. I mean, it, it's all there in black and white. But they say, hey, where's the case against us? Kali Janathan Reddy has spent about three years in jail. Mr. Yadurappa, three weeks in jail, or a little more. <coughs> and then after that, he breaks away from the party, now he's back. So uh, I want you to analyze for me the relationship between the Bharatiya Janata Party in Delhi. You remember the famous picture where you show Sushma Swaraj with her hands on the two. And then later on, Sushma Swaraj says, I have not got a single paisa from them. How do you analyze the impact of the BJP embracing the Gali Janadan Reddy and the miners, the so-called dirty miners of Ballari. Uh, Paranjai, as elections approach, this very esoteric term, winnability, uh, and nobody has really defined what are the contours of this winnability. Now, winnability becomes the issue. Uh, and I think the way in which the Reddy brothers have made a return to mainstream politics, uh, I think is a reflection of that. But I must add another point. I would say both the Congress and the BJP are guilty of having given nominations to people whose records on the mining issue itself have not been clean. The Lard family was always with the Congress, but Anand Singh, who was an MLA belonging to the BJP, is now, now with the Congress. the Congress. But you could argue that the, 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 the people who were supposed to be spearheading the illegal mining scam, they are today uh, very much with the BJP. Yeah. See, Not uh, just uh, Soma uh, Shekhar yeah. Reddy, yeah. Sri yeah. Ramulu. Yeah. No, uh, uh, what is grabbing public attention is the fact that uh, at the national level, the BJP has launched this very strong campaign of fighting corruption, of not defending those who uh, have violated the law. And, and uh, even in 2014, when you had the Lok Sabha elections, the Prime Reddy Minister brothers Modi were kept out of the whole Prime picture. Minister Modi's yeah. famous statement, yeah. na khaunga, yes. na khani dunga. So, uh, but then, 
the state unit of the BJP chief ministerial candidate has clearly said that the Reddy brothers are important in winning 10 to 12 seats. And therefore, in a close election, this becomes important. Those 10 to 12 seats uh, yeah. matter a so lot. So, at one stage, the BJP tried to maintain this distance. That the state unit of the party wants these brothers in, but we don't want them anywhere close. The party president has consistently maintained that Janardhan Reddy is not officially anywhere on the uh, podium of the BJP. Uh, he cancelled a rally in Bellary for that reason. But interestingly, when the Prime Minister's rally was held in Bellary, the cousins they, they were, were all, all on the stage there. because they were contestants. So I don't know if this is a price that the BJP thought uh, has to be paid uh, in that desperate bid to be able to win a state. Now, I think uh, tomorrow we'll get to know whether it's actually worked. Because there is also this view that uh, to win a few seats, which ultimately you may not also win, have you sacrificed something, uh, have you sacrificed that moral edge across which, the state and across, across and the country? Across the country, yeah. correct. So, so that's an important question. But and, and if you look at this debate anywhere, whenever the BJP is asked, uh, what is this you have done, they will never answer that question. But they will say, look, the Congress has also fielded these such people. No, no, and, 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 and you also see uh, also the CBI, the Central Bureau of Investigation, apparently, you know, <laughs> just giving them a clean sheet in I some cases or just uh, not going ahead with the investigations yeah, sure, of these cases sure, on uh, sure. what appears to be rather flimsy grounds. I, I hope the sagacity of the Karnataka voter, who at the end of the day can actually put a stop to this, would clearly send a message in this election saying, Irrespective of party, if somebody does not have a clean image, we are not going to elect them, we are not going to support them. That will be a very strong message to every political party that next time you put up a candidate, be careful on this fact because at the end of the day, the voter does not take kindly you, to you know, issue. Once again, we have conflicting views. You recall in the, in the mid-80s and the late 80s, people said, oh, Beauforts won't matter for Rajiv Gandhi. But today on hindsight, we said, no, the, the, the impact of Beauforts on Rajiv Gandhi, he was the youngest ever prime minister, his rise was as spectacular as his decline. So this whole issue of corruption, whether it matters at all to ordinary voters, especially poor voters, poor people. In fact, there are two conflicting trends which are coming up. Uh, when we asked in our survey whether Sidramaya government has done enough to check corruption, or has corruption increased or decreased or remained the same during uh, Congress rule, people said actually that the corruption has increased. On the other hand, it's got are, nothing to do with his what? Uh, yeah, nothing his to do with the watch. watch. His watch uh, which is uh, also. But then the same people, when asked which is the most corrupt party in Karnataka, Congress, BJP, or Janata Dal, they actually pointed out to the BJP. So uh, the people do feel that the corruption record of the BJP has not been very clean, has not been very something uh, positive. And they also believe that the Sidramaya government has not done enough to be able to check corruption in the state. So both get very poor marks uh, on this critical issue. Okay, so if I have to summarize your views and if you sort of tie up all the, you know, sort of connect all the dots and tie up all the loose ends, we just have a little while to wait before we know the outcome. You would say your view is that it's slight advantage to the Congress, is it? It's a slight advantage to the Congress. Uh, one of the two is definitely going to be in triple digits. Uh, it looks it's to either be the Congress it, the either the Congress or the BJP. The Congress seems to be having a nose ahead. However, the last week of campaign where you saw the Prime Minister really pulling out all yeah, stuffs, may, uh, all the increasing the rallies that he had and all that, whether that actually has impacted on the voter, whether that has been translated by the party carders on the ground will be the critical question. Okay. And if that has happened, I would not be surprised if the BJP actually okay. moves ahead of the like, like a good analyst and a good scholar, you are hedging your bets a little bit. But thank you so uh, much. <laughs> I, I think I would, I, I, I respect the sagacity of the Karnataka voter, who I think at the end of the day would give a verdict which would provide for that stability in the state for five years. Which of the two parties the voter feels, I think, 
I would bow my head down to the wisdom of the voter in that regard. Okay, thank you so much for giving us your time and uh, for this very, very lucid analysis. And we just have a short while to wait before the outcome of thank the elections so will be known. You just heard and watched eminent political scientist, Professor Sandeep Shastri, explaining the various factors that could influence the outcome of the Legislative Assembly elections in Karnataka. You just have a short while to wait before you know the final outcome. Thank you for being with us.